The Fusilans Pilot, written by Eamon Hartnett. The Fusilans is the Gold Fork series of the Utensil franchise. Text, copyright 2015 through 2020. Audio recording 2020. Narrated by the writer. Act 1. On Black. God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. G.K. Chesterton. On Black. The following takes place on many alternate timelines, none of which included the PBS show Shining Time Station. Fade In. Exterior Rooftop. Night. Riker Fuseland, 24, and Lizzie Fuseland, 24, emerge onto the roof of a tall building. Expressionless and unfocused, they walk zombie-like to the ledge and climb its low wall. Chiron, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 10.31 p.m., Thursday, June 8, 1995, C.E. Riker wears a faded orange hat that says, New York Mets World Series, 1986. Lizzie wears a t-shirt depicting a Rubik's Cube with too many different colors. Pinter, 36, in a gray uniform, emerges pointing a gun. Pinter, don't jump, regret recurs eternally. A mid-sized RV appears from nowhere. Riker and Lizzie stop looking zoned out, now confused. The RV opens. Out walks Roman Fuseland, 31, blue eyes, nervous and shy, wearing light blue cargo shorts and a plain black t-shirt. Chiron, the original Roman Fusiland. Roman. Hi, hi there, um... The world freezes in time except for Roman and Omega. 44, male, mechanical gray eyes, wearing a silver jumpsuit, who also appears from nowhere. Roman's shocked. Omega. Hello, Roman. Pleased to meet you. Please allow me to in... Roman. Are... are you... Omega. Yes, the one you call the Tyrant, a secret... Roman. You've done a lot of damage to this universe, Tyrant. Omega. To serve a greater good in the multiverse. Care to hear me out? Interior stand-up comedy club stage. Night. Riker confidently performs, still in his Mets hat. Chiron. Tulsa, Oklahoma. 10.14 p.m. Thursday, June 8th, 1995 CE. 17 minutes earlier, on a later timeline. Riker. Now maybe one day it won't be like that. But until then, just remember that fried chicken thigh has a price. Good night, everyone. He gets a big laugh, rolling into applause as he gets off and approaches two women in the back. Jessica, 30, and Lizzie, who carries a child Roman, 3, hazel eyes. Jessica wears pink glasses. Child Roman holds a green wooden toy train, reading Fisher Price Number 1. The group exits to the bar. Chiron, second derivative Roman Fusilund. Lizzie, crowds of four, you were a seven. Interior stand-up comedy club bar, night. They find a spot to stand. Jessica. Freaking four? You gave an eight to that group from Dr. Henry III's Greenhouse for the Tone Deaf. Riker. Hey, they were very perceptive about physical comedy. Riker does a perfect comedic fall. Jessica checks her watch. Riker. Okay, Jessica, you're going up for this crowd tonight, right? You want our saffron honesty or emerald benevolence? Jessica takes out a pill bottle. Jessica. I want to wipe their memories away like in Men in Grey after I bomb. You want any of these? They're new, called Ducca Samsara or something. Not sure what they do. Lizzie. Sold. Jessica removes the cap, and three yellow and black bees fly out and into the mouths of Jessica, Riker, and Lizzie. Jessica. I still can't believe you do drugs in front of your kid like that. Riker. Eh, with all the hours he's spending in comedy clubs and the seedy venues Lizzie's band plays, it's not like our little Roman's gonna turn out normal anyway. Riker and Lizzie's faces both become expressionless and unfocused as before. Lizzie drops child Roman on the floor. The child falls slowly and lands comfortably. Lizzie and Riker walk toward the door, zombie-like. Jessica transforms into a pink rabbit, leaps, shrinks in the air, and disappears into the pill bottle, which lands on the floor next to child Roman. The child plays with his toy train and eats fistfuls of golden honey from the pill bottle, blissfully undisturbed. Interior security office, night. Two gun-toting security guards in matching gray uniforms, Yusufa, 34, and Pinter, watch several monitors showing parts of a large office building. Enjoying each other's company, they eat burritos and in harmony hum a commercial jingle playing on the radio. Pinter plays a crossword puzzle. Pinter, what's the Spanish diminutive for mosque? 
On one screen, Riker and Lizzie enter the lobby. Yusufa. Noses. Yusufa quickly touches her own nose. Pinter. Hey, cut it off. Exterior rooftop. Night. Again, Pinter emerges to see Riker and Lizzie on the ledge. Pinter. Don't jump. Regret recurs eternally. A similar RV appears. Riker and Lizzie switch from zoned out to confused. Out walks a younger Roman, 24, our protagonist. Green eyes, eager and confident. In dark green cargo shorts and a plain brown t-shirt. Easygoing and generally unfazed, he has a plan, but is enjoying the ride. Chiron, first derivative Roman Fusilund. Roman, howdy, I'm your son, Roman, and I'm here to save your life. Riker, Lizzie, and Pinter look bewildered as Riker and Lizzie climb off the wall. Roman closes his eyes for a beat. Riker, did Jessica figure out how to wipe our memories with a neuralizer? Roman, nope, on the timeline I came from, this is where the gods of the multiverse staged your suicide. No one seems to be hacking us now, though, so welcome back to life. Pinter, time out, how'd this RV appear out of thin air like Frodo Baggins? Interior security office, night. Yusufa holds a phone and watches the screen showing the roof. She sees Roman point a finger at Pinter. A red laser beam shoots out of it, disintegrating Pinter. Yusufa screams. Exterior rooftop, night. They look at the pile of black and white ash that was Pinter. Lizzie. Did you just murder that dude? Roman. Yeah, technically kind of, but it's fine. He's not leaving anyone behind to cry and grieve. His whole timeline's about to go belly up. Riker. What does that mean, you evil sorcerer? You're killing us too? You're blowing up the world or something, you wizard Stalin? Lizzie. Oh wait, this must be from Jessica's drug, right? Riker. Ha, cool, good call. You know, this is top notch. I'll admit, I was worried for a hot second. Roman. No, the drug was the god's decoy. I was raised in the foster care system, thinking my parents got high and killed themselves. The gods engineered my genes and life experience to make me invent time travel, longing my whole life to come back here and save you two. So, but if you folks do want to come, I figured, why not let you tag along? Come on, what do you say? Hop in. Lizzie. We need to brag we did this before everyone. What did she call it? Riker. Ducky Samsari something? Roman. Ducka Samsara. Lizzie. Hold up, it's weird that we can both see him though, right? Roman. You'll get to camp out in the past to keep me company while I design a better universe. I'm a quality adventure buddy. Never cook weird smelling food. Riker. Whoa, the detail on his face is intense. Can I touch, or will that break the multiverse or something? Riker and Lizzie both touch his face before getting an answer. They hug and kiss him. He reciprocates awkwardly. Roman. The multiverse is unharmed by your impulsiveness, I assure you. Lizzie. Our son invented time travel. Who's the bad mother now, Becky? Roman. Only because some bizarre forces from before the dawn of time chose me to, but yeah, pretty much. Riker. Still none of this feels real, but eh, I'll take it. Roman. Indicating the RV. Delightful, so let's climb on in, shall we? Lizzie. Wait a minute, what about our kid? Riker. And the guy you just murdered. Do you think we'd ignore that? You know, son, science can't teach us any morality. That's the rule. The tall, hot cathedral attic isn't its own purpose. Roman. The kid grew up to be me on a prior timeline, and now he'll do what the guard would have. Stop existing as soon as we leave for the past. Don't worry about it. When I'm done with my cosmic alchemy, having rearranged every point and particle in this universe, it'll all be one timeless, impersonal cosmic hedonism machine anyway. Riker and Lizzie look worried. Roman holds the door open. Lizzie. A hedonist what now? Roman. A cohesive, four-dimensional, utilitarian heaven from this cosmos. A bleached nirvana. Perfect, blank, joyful bliss about nothing, without any characters or story in it. I'll explain more at our family's new home. Lizzie. We're not moving anywhere without our child. Roman. Look, another security guard's on her way up. If she gets here before we leave, I'll kill her in front of you too. But I really prefer that image of me not echoing in your heads quite so strongly. Repetition's a powerful force. Riker. Now wait, are you telling us that when you go to the past, everyone outside this RV will die? Roman. The probabilistic quantum decisions leading to their existence will be undone, yes. Riker and Lizzie consider this. Lizzie. Why did you even save us if you're just going to kill everybody? Roman sighs and points a finger forward. A blue laser beam shoots out, making the hazel-eyed toddler from earlier appear in front of them. Child Roman still plays with his green toy train, blissfully undisturbed. His parents rush to him. Roman. Fine, we'll deal with it later. He's coming with us. Riker and Lizzie glance at each other, and their mutual concern turns to mutual resolve. Lizzie. Yeah, we're on board. Roman. Woohoo! Roman pumps his fist, and they all get in. Yusufa emerges as the RV disappears. Yusufa's gun vanishes, 
A much older blue-eyed Roman, Angelon Photos, 63, our antagonist, appears. He has long white hair and a beard, wears a baggy black robe and dark blue flip-flops, and looks unkempt and deranged. Driven mad by decades of a kind of solitary confinement, Angelon has a plan too, but he enjoys no part of this ride. Chiron, the original Roman Fusiland, a.k.a. Angelon Photos. Angelon Photos, shouting at the sky. Why, tyrant? Why wilt thou not let us delete this random woman? Yusufa, who are you? What in all blazing hell is going on here? Angelon Photos, is it thy first time around? Art thou something new to dissect? Amen and hallelujah! Exterior Romans Island, day. A 360 square mile island with beaches, mountains, forests, plains, and rivers. 19th century steam locomotives move clockwise along tracks carving intricate paths. There's a mansion, a factory, a runway with fighter jets, docks full of boats, and rows of cars from parts of the 20th century. Chiron, first derivative Roman Fusilans Island, mid-Atlantic. 1232 p.m., January 29th, 100,000 BCE. The cars include a cherry red Chevy pickup, a maroon Subaru, a Maserati, Range Rovers, Jaguars, and Porsches. The Fusilan family sips cold drinks on the mansion's patio. Hazel-eyed second derivative child Roman plays with his train, a chess set, a deck of cards, and a small porcelain turtle. Riker and Lizzie both have black devices in front of them, resembling 2010 smartphones, Romkinators. Green-eyed first derivative adult Roman lectures his parents. Roman. So if, for example, you want a perfect to the atom first edition of The Catcher in the Rye, just use your Romkinator to ask service. Service speaks in a female British AI voice from Lizzie's Romkinator. Service, voiceover. Printing. A blue laser beam shoots out from Lizzie's Romkinator, making an apparently first edition hardcover copy of it appear. Lizzie. Nothing phony about that. Riker. Geez, when you said camping out, I thought you meant in the RV. You should have hyped this island paradise more. It's like the RV was the dusty old lamp and you're its genie. Lizzie. There's no number limit for these wishes, is there? Roman. No, because I'm not a genie. What I do is science, not magic. Lizzie. The difference being? Roman. Well, human fantasy generally deals in abstract metaphysical entities, like true love is a force powerful enough to reverse curses and return souls to their bodies, and that kind of Abrahamic silver spoon nonsense. I'm not doing that. I'm just pushing subatomic particles around with the Hellenic bronze knife. Riker and Lizzie both look lost. Lizzie. How do you make our son appear, then? Roman. My younger double was no harder to print than Salinger's classic. Service located his atomic pattern and transported the right atoms through my Big Bang anchor. The whole universe, this side of the Big Bang, is my Etch-a-Sketch. Riker, I'm still lost. Roman. Atmos is an ancient Greek word meaning uncuttable from the verb temno, from which we also get the popular English name tumnus. Lizzie. We can use time travel to keep doing shows in the present, right? Roman. By all means, perform music and comedy in 1995 Tulsa all you want if that's what your little hearts desire, or try to build audiences in different decades on different timelines. Follow the straight and narrow Golden Forked Path, chasing the sunset from Jerusalem to California and beyond. Reach for the ever-blue sky. Riker, what kind of cable service you got? Roman. Oh, a popular early 21st century provider called Netflix and Quarantine. You know, it's perfect for people who can't time travel, but might like to pretend to. Fade out. Act 2. Fade in. Interior white space. Timeless. Omega reclines in one of two leather seats near a wood desk. Surrounded by infinite white space in all directions, no floor visible. There's a translucent pet frog on the desk. We sporadically hear crickets chirp. Chiron, United Humanity Universe Anchor, before Big Bang. In front of him stands a wood door, shut in a frame surrounded by nothing. A flushing is heard, and the 31-year-old blue-eyed original Roman walks out. Chiron, the original Roman Fusilund. Roman. Okay, I admit it, the multiverse has some fantastic restrooms. Built into the wood desk are several VCRs with paused VHS tapes labeled Scientists, Secret Agents, Representatives, and Fantasy Chamber, and a running tape labeled Toilets. Omega pauses it, and the door disappears. Roman sits on the other seat, where candy and soda wait. Roman. And fine, Multiverse Candy's better than Starburst. You happy now? Omega. I'm an unwoke member of the species Homo Servians. I'm a serving organism, not a wise one. Happiness wouldn't help me accomplish my assigned mission. Roman. Is this real leather, by the way? Omega. Atomically, yes. A hologram appears, showing scientists working with particle colliders. Some are intersex and androgynous, with face and body shapes blurring male and female. Some are children. Some have eyes that artificially glow brightly in various colors. 
Omega. So United Humanity anchored the Big Bang in 2119, but our anchor was shortly attacked by New Way, the terrorist group founded by Epsilon the Servi after the second time he went unwoke. Quantum probability calculators said if we let our timeline play out, our anchor would soon be stolen or shattered. In the hologram, hundreds line up for teleportation machines. Omega. We evacuated top representatives, scientists, and secret agents out from the positive side of the universe. These representatives include not just elected UH officials, but also Alpha, the first woke survey, who was then Queen of the USA, and Winnie Smith, who was then High Priest of the Church of Cosmos. These representatives then voted to cut animation off beyond 2127, ideally until a plan was devised to destroy New Way. Roman. Got some spite for Bugs Bunny, Doc? Omega. No, no, this is all live action. In 22nd century physics, universe animation refers to the extent a universe's light force is breathing through it, i.e. how much of its quantum data is being processed. We do have the power to animate cartoon worlds out here too, though. Like in some of the smaller, lower resolution universes we've now built on the negative side of the Big Bang, we've brought to life a few animated fantasy TV shows that were produced by the Church of Cosmos in the 2080s and 90s on the original positive timeline, like Flutter for a Fortnite, Silmar's Prince, Elvesen. The hologram shows clips from these cartoon universes. Roman. Okay, sure, but back to 2127? Omega. Right, leaving from then, thousands of scientists then spent their adulthoods out here in the negative space-time before the Big Bang, and found New Way's fourth dimension invasion so corrosive that the only way to preserve the original positive timeline's matter arrangement up until 2127 now is to leave the universe's whole positive animated space-time untouched. The hologram shows scientists studying a clear glass egg, the positive universe, inside of which is a light green bush with roses and thorns, burning with orange fire without dying and a gray dust cloud swirling counterclockwise. There's a small crack coming through the glass from inside. Roman. So your government has to make its own new way. Omega. Built by human democratic compromise. Since we can't go home, we hope instead to ultimately flood the negative space-time with a multiverse of perfect universes which beautifully and tastefully animate a journey of progress toward the character of late humanity, to quote the statute that authorized my mission. Roman. Character of late humanity? Omega. Yes, with a human history that eventually reflects individual freedom, equality, unity, peace, and the progress of those values out of fascist, ape-like barbarism, in an especially beautiful way. Roman. No, no, I'm not going to be your guy to help with that at all. Exterior Roman's Island. Day. The Fuselin family just rescued by the 24-year-old green-eyed first derivative Roman still sit on the patio. Chiron. First and second derivative Roman Fuselins. Lizzie. So you think the future of humanity should just be hedonism? Roman. The future and past of the universe, not humanity. My goal involves destroying all humans and other Earth life, still working on cosmic utilitarian joyful intensity, and on the intelligence force needed to hatch out into the multiverse and ward off further invasions. But it should be ready in anywhere between 13 weeks and 9 years, so get your time travel adventuring in now. Lizzie. And so is that what the gods from before time chose you to do? Roman. No, they built me to invent time travel. Multiverse intelligences haven't done much here. I've never met them in person, but if I look close enough, I see the sparkling red architecture is all strikingly gorgeous angels. Long live our skillful rearrangements of them. Lizzie. Then will the toddler we're raising grow up to be 12 at most, or can time travel age him up faster? Roman. That's a good point. He's the only one inside this universe with the potential to become a real threat to me. For safety, I really shouldn't let him get much older than 10. Huh. Extra incentive for me to work quickly, I guess. Riker and Lizzie look horrified. Roman remains calm. Riker. Sorry, but is there maybe any room for negotiation on that last part? Lizzie. We'd raise him to treat you like a brother. You know, no rivalry. Roman. It's not up for debate. You keep the kid as a pet until I finish. Accept that or I delete you and make a version of you who will. Riker and Lizzie look offended and worried. Roman. Now, stay by your romcanators to make sure I don't lose track of you. If I ever do, I'll just atomic 3D print a double. So wander off all you like, but how about we start by going on some adventures altogether? What are your top time travel wishes? Meet Plato? See the writing of the Magna Carta? Lizzie. Shit, I mean, it's better than us all dying now, I guess, right? Riker nods, speechless. They gain new resolve. Lizzie. Okay, I'd be thrilled to meet my lyrical anti-hero, Avi Ozedra, back when his band Burning Volks Corper was just starting out. Riker. And my favorite roller coaster, the Screaming Demon at Scandia, broke down for good while I was away at college. I'd love a last ride, maybe even the last ride. 
Roman. Hoping that band name is ironic, let's flip a coin to let the multiverse gods decide which of those happens next. He takes out a 2008 Hawaii state quarter and flips it. Exterior angle on photos is planet. Afternoon. A 180 square foot island with two pine trees in the center, one red and one blue. The tiny island's surface is covered in sandcastles. Angelon and Yusufa stand surrounded by endless blue ocean and sky, a sun far to their west. Chiron, Angelon Photos' planet, 9,999,999,968 BCE. Yusufa, well done, Mr. Fuseland, weirdest dream ever. Even beats that one with the creepy ghost puppeteers. Angelon Photos. Fool, we dropped the name the tyrant gaveth me half my life ago. Canst thou guess my name? Today, I am Angelon Photos. Angelon pronounces the S like the one in fructose, while Yusufa uses a Z sound as in the plural of photo. Yusufa. Sorry, angling on photos? Angelon Photos. Angelon Photos. When a tyrant playeth God and designeth thee to be their savior, thou hast a moral duty to rebel. I am my own messenger of light, which is why I now go by that ancient Greek phrase from popular culture. Yusufa. Popular culture? Angle on Photos. Second Corinthians? Exterior Scandia Amusement Park parking lot. Day. The large, mostly empty parking lot of a small amusement park with cars mostly from the 1980s. The pavement gleams like it's just rained. A gray 1989 Honda Accord appears. The Fuselins get out and walk. Chiron, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 10:12 a.m., Thursday, May 31st, 1990 CE. Riker. First, let's check out the restroom. It has those charming faucets. Lizzie. Charming faucets? You forgot to go on the island. Who here do you figure you fooled? Roman, closing his eyes. All good. Service new and left time before the ride breaks down. Exterior angle on photos is planet. Evening. As the tide gradually rises, some of the sandcastles get washed away. The sun is now near setting, painting the western sky a gorgeous cinnabar. Yusufa. But who's the tyrant? Angle on photos. There's no Lincoln without slavery, no Einstein without the Holocaust, no Isakov without the robot wars, no westward expansion without Stanislav Jefferson fighting heatedly against it, no carnivores without the terror of their victims, or me without the tyrant killing my parents. That's the kind of suffering which only a tyrant multiplieth by the millions. Call us me a red-pilled, angrily awoken, outraged cynic, but I say that if thou art a bold, passionate lover of that fate, or else art stoically, coldly indifferent to it, Thou hast absurdly chosen the side of oppression, pain, and suffering. The only morally acceptable choice, then, is to keep passionately hating fate. I'd rather struggle eternally to resist, than ever for even one tremendous miraculous moment submit. Yusufa. That doesn't explain anything. What am I here for? Why'd Pinter die? Angle on Photos. Thou mayest be a useful enough engine for us to keep alive. Please sit and help thyself to any food or drink thou wantest. I shall let thy brain will them here. A glass patio table and a white plastic chair appear. On the table are a large ceramic bowl and metal utensils. Yusufa sits. The bowl is blue, with ocean waves painted on it. To its right are a silver spoon with the word Jerusalem engraved on its handle, and a bronze knife engraved Athens. To the bowl's left is a three-pronged gold fork engraved New English Sunset. A large piece of pork with bones in it and a small cold glass beer bottle with a gold crown on its label appear. Yusufa uses the knife and fork to cut the pork and feed herself, and sips the golden beer. Angle on photos. Normally I see this all in my spinning head, but for thee, why not put on a show? Three giant floating Polaroids appear, showing videos of the Fuselins in the park bathroom stalls. Angelon starts to wave his arms at the Polaroids, and the Fuselins move in response. Angelon smiles as he conducts. Angelon photos. My universe is my canvas. The colors on my palette, all our favorite towns. I paint an amoral beauty to make the gods see my art as a mirror into their dark souls. Whatever pain and suffering I compose down here shall never compare to what those bits of data holding affixed in an unmoved anchor at the center of the cosmic wheel orchestrate up there. I aim to use the representation of suffering here to render an image that pierces right through the gods' psyches, and so drives them to end their multiverse project. The sun then disappears beyond the western horizon. Exterior Scandia Amusement Park Bathrooms, Day. 
a row of indoor stalls and outdoor sinks, awkwardly carrying the child Roman away from there. The adult Roman passes a group of three male teenagers, 17 through 18, Noah, Ping, and Hassan, entering the stalls. From inside a stall, Riker overhears the teens. Noah, if we don't hit Screamin' Demon, this whole trip's a waste. Ping, nah, come on, we did an out of galaxy. Besides, I got my girl at home waiting. Hassan, just one? You wimpy good houseboy. Riker and the teens emerge from their stalls. Riker, okay, first off, it's the Screamin' Demon, but more importantly, you do need to go on this ride today. And you've got all the time you want. I can prove it. Follow me. Riker leads them away from there. Lizzie emerges from a stall and washes her hands. Avi Oz Edra, 22, male, long, wavy, fiery ginger hair, pale, freckled face in crimson nylon stockings and lipstick, diced with too many dots as earrings, exits a stall. Avi sees a reflection of Lizzie's shirt in a mirror. Avi, angry. Hey, where'd you get that? Lizzie, oh god, you're Avi Oz Edra. Wow, and how old are you? 1990, so... Avi, the shirt, jackass. Lizzie, the cover of Solstice Room, one of your best albums, A minus work. Avi, blushing. That image hasn't been released, and we're still recording Solstice Room, so I don't know what album you heard, but you'd better explain where you got that shirt. Lizzie, oh, Roman set this up, right? Avi, what? What's a Roman? Lizzie, Roman Fuselin's my son. Avi, really? Lizzie, like Solstice Room sounds normal? Avi, Solstice Room means... Lizzie, I know what it means. I've heard you talk about it in interviews that haven't happened yet. Candidly, I can dance to it all night long. I'm a true slavish stan. But sure, Roman must be killing twin birds, granting my first wish at the same time as Riker's. So you're going on the roller coaster? Avi, I just have to know how you got our cover and make you stop wearing it. Lizzie, well, it can't be coincidence, so I guess he just didn't fill you in. But he said we could wander and had you meet me alone over here. Exterior angle on Photos' planet. Night. The black skies full of bright white stars and three moons, pristinely reflected by the black ocean. The tide has continued to rise. Yusufa's halfway through her pork. Yusufa. She's right, the singer being there is way too big a coincidence. Angle on Photos, still conducting. Correct. We just invented him to test their responses to a series of super-secret Nazi equinox eggs. I'm trying to help them. Did the dark, sarcastic classroom of life fail to teach thee that backwards rock and roll is the devil's music? Exterior Scandia Amusement Park. Day. On the opposite side of the bathroom building, the teenagers pile into a new 1989 Honda. Adult and child Romans play with a huge set of wooden orange toy train tracks and many colored trains, building elaborate structures together on the still glistening concrete. Riker. So they settled on the world debut of Star Wars. Come on, Roman, you'll love this. Child Roman. No, I want to stay here. We're in such a lovely story about these growing, serpentine, many-colored train characters. They still have so many lessons to learn and so many hugs to share. Roman. I'll mind him. It's too long since the last time I played Stanislav the Steam Engine and Comrades. The child sneezes clear white snot onto his own face. Adult Roman shoots a cyan laser beam at him. Riker gasps until he sees it's just to get rid of the snot. Roman. What, you think I'd decapitate him? Really, enjoy your side adventure. May the force and all that. Interior Yen and Yang Space Station Shopping Center. Space. A futuristic indoor amusement park and shopping mall with a bright, multicolored floor. Lizzie and Avi both sing and play electric guitars. It's great rock and roll. They have drawn a crowd, nearly all either European or Asian. Many intersex and androgynous. Many children. Many unnaturally tall. Many glide on hovering boards. Many have eyes that artificially glow brightly in various colors. Fade out. Act 3. Fade in. Interior white space. Timeless. Omega and the blue-eyed original Roman, 31, stand among rows of thousands of wood pedestals, topped with glass eggs glowing with white electric light. Behind the glass of each one is a swirling dust cloud and coiled tungsten filament. We keep sporadically hearing the crickets here. Chiron, the original Roman Fuseland, United Humanity Universe anchor, before Big Bang. The positive universe, still slightly cracked, is the only glass egg containing fire or a living plant. Floating holograms show the historical figures Omega mentions. Omega, this glass egg here is where UH came from, the positive universe. The original versions precise to the atom of the four-dimensional lives of Caesar, Jefferson, Lincoln, Isaacoff, and the species Tyrannosaurus rex are all right there. 
From our frame of reference, every moment of their lives stays happening right now. Most of these others are lower resolution doubles we made of it, including yours. You're one of millions of time travel inventors whose genes and lives will be designed via timeline changes after Albert Einstein's death in 1955 in these negative universe doubles. You each grew up learning the insights of an Einstein whose life was identical to the originals, then went and mastered your own universe. Roman. What kind of timeline changes? Omega. Oh, in some of our universes, Obama called Kanye a jackass in 2009. So then in 2020, Kanye campaigned for Trump instead of beating him. In others, Katy Perry never inspired Cato P. Marcuse's mom to have a kid. In some, the Berenstain Bears instead went by Berenstain, leading to Nelson Mandela dying in prison in the 1980s. We hope one of you, our precious design inventors, may build the model for a perfect human-centric four-dimensional space-time fabric arrangement. Roman. So each phony electric universe is ruled from inside by its own passionate, a tourist Lucifer. And all universes are ruled from outside by the same indifferent bureaucratic god. Gods tasked each Lucifer with Frankensteining his or her own universe. Omega. We prefer modern Prometheus. You can go by Lucifer if it helps you to sleep or if you're in need of some restraint. But hot passion and cold indifference aren't binary. Heroic protagonists are individuals who inspire emulators by marching clockwise calmly, truthfully, and with fearless, courageous purpose on the fiery orange, frigid gold threshold, in rhythm with the counterclockwise marchers to disguise the only effective form of progress as tradition. Roman. Well, it's all too human. But what kind of mad, sick psychopath could look at Earth's original history up to 1955 and ask cosmic fate to play it over and over and over again in millions of copies, essentially not changing anything, rippling humanity's primitive fascism and original sin forever and always across the cosmic ocean? Omega. Everyone who wants kids and every civilization that wants to last. Roman. Exactly. Omega. Who would be mad enough not to? You think you're a sane enough man to spend your whole life cynically worrying about how we ought to tape over all those stories with the white noise of your impersonal cosmic utilitarianism engine? Roman. Yes, and I worry I would have been able to make a more useful engine if I didn't know like half of these devils in the blue details. Omega. So you've come to the orange-gold fork of modern westward culture in your sad, moody blue railroad. Roman. Yes, sure. And since it's all so ugly and unnecessary, from here onward I shall be only a no-sayer. Interior Yen and Yang Space Station Shopping Center Space. More shoppers watch Lizzie and Avi perform. There's a giant statue of the Yen and Yang logo on this timeline. Two snakes, one silver and one bronze, eating each other's tails, intertwined in a double helix shape resembling the backbones of DNA, with rows of oranges between them as the bases. Chiron, Yen and Yang Space Station, 07304, 1209 p.m. Universal Time. Tuesday, June 5th, 2068 CE. There's a plastic orange statue of balance scales, holding a rat wearing a red baseball cap and a tiger wearing a gold crown. 1220 Kage, an intersex half-white, half-Asian child, eats salmon and crab sushi with orange wood chopsticks. Lizzie and Avi finish playing to much applause. 1220. Wowers, Trey Donko, who are yous? Lizzie. Lizzie Fuseland, here from the 90s in my son's time machine. Most shoppers scream and run away. Shoppers. A fusil and s known. Troublesome brawl and doubles retrend. A few stay near the bewildered Lizzie and Avi. Police robots approach with futuristic guns. A blue laser beam shoots out of Lizzie's romcanator, printing a telephone booth-sized bronze time machine. Lizzie and Avi make it in time, but not before 1220 gets in with them. Exterior Chinese theater. Day. Riker and the teenagers walk out. The Honda pulls up. Chiron, Hollywood, CA, 12.17 p.m., Wednesday, May 25th, 1977. Ping, yo, so we're repeating that, right? Riker, as Darth Vader, I've been waiting for you, teens. The circle shall now be complete. They cheer and get in, and the Honda disappears. Exterior Chinese theater, day. The Honda's already there. Riker and the teenagers get out as the one we just saw leave appears behind it. A set of Riker and the teenagers get out of this one, too. The teenagers yell at their respective Rikers. Chiron, Hollywood, CA, 9.55 a.m., Wednesday, May 25th, 1977. Male teenagers. Kill them! Delete these doubles! Use your Ramka whatever! Zap them! Both Rikers tap their Ramkinators furiously to no avail. Giving up, both groups run back into their respective Hondas. Interior 2nd Honda, day. 
The group piles in. Service speaks from the car speakers. Service, voiceover. Sorry, we intended to arrive on a clean timeline. We've been hacked. Chiron, Hollywood, CA, 9.54 a.m., Wednesday, May 25th, 1977. The world changes around the car. They're surrounded by dozens of doubles of the Honda. As many Rikers and teenagers brawl with their own doubles on the sparkling pavement, for every Riker there's an orange Mets hat. Blood pours. We hear Lizzie and Avi's rock music. More cars appear, bringing new Rikers and teenagers to join the fight. Car windows are smashed open. Our group's pulled into the mayhem. Exterior Scandia Amusement Park. Day. Green-eyed adult Roman and hazel-eyed child Roman play with the wood trains, the world around them frozen in time. Chiron, first and second derivative Roman fusilums. Their track has expanded considerably. Adult Roman shoots a few red laser beams from his finger to disintegrate a frozen carousel, ferris wheel, and people, turning them to black and white ash, so their track can continue to expand. The child picks his nose and gold comes out, which he eats. Child Roman. So it's okay for us to kill people? Roman. I mean, like, we could choose to cry for them if we're in the mood for a good glistening wet breadcrumb trail, but we're not exactly burning the Library of Alexandria or Monticello here. Interior Bronze Time Machine. Timeless. Lizzie, Avi, and 1220 are cramped in. 1220 is crying. Chiron, first derivative Roman's universe anchor. 1220. Are you saying everyone we left outside this phone booth is dead? Service, voiceover. The probabilistic quantum decisions leading to their existence have been undone, yes. See you around. A red laser beam shoots down from the ceiling and disintegrates 1220 leaving a pile of black and white ash. Avi laughs, and Lizzie tries to look calm and composed. Lizzie. Service, are Riker and both of my sons together and fine? Service, voiceover. Your sons are, though I can't reach them. Riker seems to be suffering. Lizzie. Suffering? What can I do to help? Service, voiceover. Photos approximate timelines we haven't been to because of the light record they capture. Hopefully we can find a photo someone shot early on in the suffering, where we can cut in. Avi jumps up and down and spins counterclockwise, smirking. Avi, getting louder. Don't you see? Everything swirling round the sun has and will forever come back together unchanged, as all very well-read, treacherously tilted right angles, times our four sapphire irises, up here on the super-high attic plateau where we can hide unheard, unfound, and unshot. So just keep dizzily dancing in this gleaming paved paradise like how we catch 22 smiling indigo protons. Exterior field, day. The rock music continues. Hundreds of gray 1989 Honda Accords fill the field. Between them, hundreds of Riker and Teenager doubles fight using giant bronze knives, silver spoons, gold forks, and orange wood pool cues as swords. The metal utensils all have the same engravings as Yusufa's. Chiron, Holy Roman Empire, Europe, 9.59 a.m., Thursday, May 25th, 1234 C.E. Hundreds of bewildered knights on horses try to stop the constantly arriving doubles from taking their armor. Many dead doubles lie about, limbs severed from sticking out of time-traveling Hondas. Some Hondas overlap with each other, causing gruesome explosions of car and human body parts. One Riker kills Emperor Frederick II, 39, stabbing him with a giant gold fork. This Riker steals the gold crown from the Emperor's head. It starts raining, flooding the field. Interior United Galaxy Space Station Bar, Space. A large bar with large windows to the great beyond. Many patrons are humans. Sadrafa is one of several fenchorls, magenta, muscular, eight-foot-tall reptilian aliens with metal tops to their skulls, standing over a table of humans who all look very angry at him. The fenchorls laugh. Chiron, United Galaxy Space Station, 07090, 2.22 a.m. Universal Time, Saturday, May 25th. 2222 CE. Sadrifa. Humans are so primitive, like Spemheos, an illiterate amphibious slug from our planet, colorblindly driven by tribal, territorial, alpha male worshipping fascist instinct. I'd wager if I insulted the captain of this group's ship, or just the precious ship itself, a hundred Riker and teenager doubles appear, fighting with giant utensils, some wearing Mets hats, some crowns. The teens now have the heads of coyotes, dingoes, and jackals. Honda human and horse body parts overlap and explode. Exterior Angolan Photos' planet, night slash dawn. Yusufa now eats cold spaghetti and ketchup on a second beer. The tide still rises. First and second derivative Romans, Lizzie and Avi, and hundreds of brawling doubles of Riker and the teens 
appear in hundreds of giant floating Polaroids over the ocean, reflected in it, the brawlers multiplying. Yusufa. So Riker and Lizzie actually influenced Roman, right? To bring the kid along? For my money, this Roman's never going to kill that kid now. He'll risk the danger. Angle on photos. No, they're all just my puppets. I did that. They'll do what I want. Yusufa. This cruel, ruthless nature of your circle game still puzzles me, then. Angolon lowers his arms. The brawling and multiplying continue as Angolon starts pacing counterclockwise around the tiny circular island circumference, growing increasingly manic as he rants, knocking over many of the sandcastles. Tiny sand airplanes fly between the remaining sandcastles. Angolon photos. One sympathetic psychoanalytic diagnosis is that the antagonism I impose on these versions of my family I create is me reenacting the tyrant's abuse. I was wide awake enough to know all power is tyrannical long before I had any power. I didn't need my Hamburg school professors at Columbia, who'd built their careers on fetishizing ignoble savagery and petulantly pathologically selling hip half-ironic edginess to teenagers. To explain that, when I'd learned it growing up in a 22nd century bureaucrat's artful take on 1990s American foster care. So don't blame me for being tyrannical with power now that I have some. Yusufa. Sounds like a prepackaged ideology you can eat with your bare hands. Yusufa twirls her gold fork clockwise in the spaghetti. Angolon transforms into a white snake, Sogal, eyes black. He keeps circling, leaving the flip-flops and robe behind. Sogal opens his mouth to reveal he has three plastic utensils for teeth, protruding down from his upper gum, a green three-pronged fork in the center, a blue spoon to its left, and a red knife to its right. The fork's head burns with orange fire without melting. Sogol speaks in Angolon's voice. Sogol. Government is downstream of fiction. Doctors may save the bodies of individuals by objectifying bodies, but artists save the souls of city-states by personifying city-states. I was made in the photonegative likeness of a creative. Dost thou know the first rule of being a competent creative? Kill thy babies. Cleave, burn, and eat them. As far as we're concerned, every atom cluster is just another Polaroid of dust cloud's illusions to deliver to our own hellfire. Sogol blows on the fiery head of his front plastic fork tooth, and the fire grows to reach the red pine tree, which explodes in a small orange mushroom cloud of fire. Half of the hundreds of giant Polaroids then burn and disintegrate. Sogol breathes in all the smoke. Yusufa finishes the beer. The sun starts to rise in the east. The oceans suddenly thoroughly polluted by shiny multicolored plastic straws. The sky's full of morning mist. Sogol stands still his snake body fully encircling Yusufa and the island, and chews on his own tail with his utensil teeth. Finishing her spaghetti, Yusufa looks at her bowl, and porridge appears in it, which she eats with the silver spoon. Yusufa, so again, why am I here? Sogol, the tyrant sent thee, Yusufa, for thy heart, mind, and fearlessly directed vision. Almost every atom in thee is naturally replaced every few months, most every couple weeks. But certain atoms in thy heart, neocortex, and eye lenses are thine for life. Thou art proof of where thou hast been, in a way even our tyrant can't forge. Thy subatomic flux put my shiny alien stars to shame tonight. Thou art the only proof I presently have for my doubles of our true origin. Yusufa. And this double told his parents Pinter's murder didn't matter because he left no one behind to cry. I'm proof of betrayal. Yusufa cries. The remaining Polaroids fly into Sogol's mouth. Yusufa. Like it's one thing at the end of the day to be at peace with nature's eternal counterclockwise swirl, it's a whole other to accelerate that on purpose. Am I just your puppet too? Sogol. How's thy porridge? Too hot or cold? Too hard or soft? Too much or not enough? Too yes or too no? Yusufa's chair breaks and she falls backward into the water. Sogol. No pinch of interpretation will end this nightmare, Yosefa. I'm damned to God this little vibrating light show of a world about nothing, and thou mayest be damned to watch. Thy artfully learned politis hath courteously saved thee. Get on my back to live. If our September programming brought thee to tears, just thou wait for the new year. Sogol grows large wings made of pastrami. Yusufa picks up a rock and skips it on the ocean, then climbs onto Sogol's back with the metal utensils. Sogol flaps his wings, and they fly into the air. Sogol again blows on the fiery head of his fork tooth, and the fire grows to reach the lone blue pine tree. It explodes in another orange mushroom cloud of fire, filling the sky with dark smoke. Sogol flies in counterclockwise circles, getting faster, making the smoke swirl. The tide rises faster. The island disappears under the plastic straws. Sogol. Now here's the story of a lovely lady named Mei Wong, who'd just earned a degree from UC Berkeley. 
And it's the story of a man named Ben, who one day in 2012 in the original Positive Universe met as software engineers at Facebook. And they knew that it was much more exterior Chinese theater day. The brawlers have brought the giant utensils, canid heads, crowns, and fentrolls back with them to 1977 Hollywood. A woman takes a Polaroid of the brawl, and with the camera's flash, a shiny titanium helicopter appears above. Its door opens to reveal Lizzie and Avi. Avi points to one Riker. Avi. Save that hero. The dragon-shaped bloodstain on his hat so hot and tall. Are those letters or characters on its damned wings? Exterior Scandia Amusement Park. Day. Green-eyed adult Roman, Riker, Lizzie, hazel-eyed child Roman, Avi, and the three male teens with canid heads all wait in line for the screaming demon. The four Fusilans all now wear gold crowns and ripped up jeans. Avi and the teens each wear differently bloodstained orange Mets hats. Roman. So a multiverse god hacked us. Anti-piracy for universes is hard. Anywho, let's make today great and enjoy this ride's last ride. Right on time. Mini-me, there's a height restriction, but I can blow you up big enough to conduct a real train. A green laser beam makes the child expand. Avi. At the speed of radium, Doc Groon? Roman. Laughs. Rolls his eyes. Oh my my my, Avi. Can you just stop with the dog whistles? I caught them all and can delete you. You're kinda cute and a super witty wordsmith and all, but I wish you weren't a literal Nazi. Unless it's the second most powerful cosmic god writing for you, you've zero reason for that angry, jealous, lazybone, paranoid resentment. Our real useful allies can crash and park here in the brighter Liebenschram. How do you account for Jewish comedic language art? A great-great-great-granddaughter of Syrian immigrants, Shepard Goldstein's 2979-bit personifying blue sneakers is the cosmic pinnacle of measurable geometric beauty. Has me in tears laughing each time. Better for you to be her slavish standing sheep than came to her able. Avi's perplexed and silently shakes his head. An operator working the ride sees the canid heads and giant child. Operator. For safety, shut this baby down. Fade out.